What we can finish off with tonight is this thought. If I change myself, then the world has a hope of changing. But if I refuse to change myself, the world has very little hope in changing. Because almost the, the world is almost always made up with a lot of other people like myself who avoid the truth about themselves. So the power of your own individual change cannot be underestimated. Now many of us start off believing that it's not possible. But eventually, once you start seeing the result of change, and this is something that I experienced in the first century a lot that I'd like to probably share with you in closing. When I was quite young in the first century, I was in my, uh, just before my teenage years, we were, we were living in Egypt. In the, um, the, the area is the area that's now known as Alexandrina, you know, in that area of Egypt, in the Delta. And uh, there was a large community there of what you would call Jewish fundamentalists, I suppose, which, of which my father was one. And they, there was co close to a million of them, in fact, living in this, in this area, a fairly large area. And they had all sorts of businesses and so forth. And as I observed the things going on in the relationship around of everything that was going on around me, I realised there was this direct relationship between cause and effect, you know, this relationship of what happened, and there was always a cause that I could see that was generally emotionally, emotional cause that I could see that turned into some kind of physical action. And I saw that unless I changed and demonstrated through my own personal actions that change was possible, no one around me would even believe change was possible. Now, at that time, I didn't know how to change. Like, I didn't understand God's love well. I had a very loose understanding of God's love. And it wasn't until much later, after I read through the prophets, and I, particularly by the time I was 12, we were still living in, Greece, in uh, Egypt. By the time I was 12, what happened was that um, I'd done more studies with the lo in the local, I suppose you'd call it tabernacle, um, and, uh, and read a lot of more of the prophets. And in particular, one of the prophets uh, struck me quite markedly, and this was the prophecies uh, related to the book of Hosea, um, which are all about love, actually. And a man who had a wife who cheated on him, and... Um, and he accepted her back. And then she cheated on him again and he accepted her back. And then she cheated on him again and he accepted her back. And I started realising that this was all about forgiveness, right? And learning how to forgive. And, and I had lots of things happening towards me that, uh, during that time that I had to forgive. So I went, started working through the process of forgiveness. As I felt the prophet Hosea was telling me that I needed to do. As a result of that, I could feel my own change. And what I noticed after changing was that things started changing around me. I didn't control them. I didn't tell anybody. They just automatically started changing. And initially I thought this was just a, like an aberration, you know, some strange phenomenon that I had no control over at all. And, uh, but as I grew, and particularly as I entered the later teenage years when I was 16, 17, I realised that this happened all the time. That every change that I made, soul change that I made, the world around me changed and people's response to me changed and how people acted towards me changed and how they acted with other people while they were with me changed even. And I didn't even have to tell them anything. It just happened. And I started seeing that all it required for things to change around me was for me to change. That's all it required. And once I started understanding the flow of God's love, as I've described to you, you know, the flow of God's love in the soul and how love would transform, and once I started engaging that process, the change occurred even more rapidly. And I found now that people were confronted that would not normally be confronted just by my own presence. Like I could just sit there and they'd be angry. They didn't even know why they were angry, but I could feel why they were. There was a soul-based interaction going on where something had healed in my soul that they wanted me to have as an addiction still, that they wanted me to have as an injury still. And something had healed inside of me that, that their addiction no longer met. And they got angry because their addiction was no longer getting met. Just me sitting there caused that. And I started realising that you barely had to really say anything. <laughs> you just had to change yourself. But then I realised 
that if I knew these things, I had to share it with others. I had to help them understand how to change themselves. That's what I need to do. And remember I said that, that, that you don't change through any effort of your own, actually. What I found happening was that as I received God's love, I changed. I released something. As a result of receiving God's love, I'd cry and release something. And then as I, as I released something, change occurred automatically around me. And I realized that all I had to do is share with other people how to change. Right? Now, it wasn't many years after that, by the, so in my 20s, um, it wasn't many years after that that I died. I was 33 or 34 years of age, actually, 30, what you call 33 and a half nowadays. I died, and, uh, and I died because of people's resistance to change. Right? That's how resistive people are to change. They're so resistant to change, they don't want to change anything. But my change created a worldwide faith that is now, while highly distorted, is now practiced by nearly 2.2 billion people. One person's change. That's how much power your soul has. One person's change. You imagine if the whole room of us changed, what that would do. If one person's change can create 2,000 years later 2.2 billion people listening to that kind of faith, although modified, then surely 100 people's change, what would that do? It would be an incredible effect on the world. But it has to be sincere change. It can't be fake, it can't be facade, it, can't, it has to be real. God created it, so it has to be real. Right. And to me, that's the beauty of what God has done too. Real change has to occur before real change on the earth has to occur. Real change has to occur individually for me before real change can occur around me. Right? But sometimes people ask myself and Mary, why is it that divine truth is not growing very rapidly? You know, you know there's the first, for the first five years that I taught it, hardly anybody listened. You know? And then the next five years I taught it, we eventually got to 900 people around the world listening. So that's 10 years now, 900 people. Now in the next year, an additional 600 people listened. Right? Now why is the change seemingly so slow? The answer is quite simple. Unless Mary and I change, everything around us can't change. Right? And this is why Mary and I are very conscious of the fact that we need to do our own personal work. And what we notice quite frequently when we're, when we're travelling, people say, oh, do you want to go and see this? And you want to go and see that? And we say, no. <laughs> we're going to spend our whole day in our motel room. And they go, what? You're in San Diego, for goodness sake. Like, the most warmest place in... Oh, it's not quite that, but, you know, one of the most pleasant places in the US. And uh, when we go, no, our soul changing is more important than that. And over 2,000 years, we've seen San Diego grow from nothing to, you know, where it is today, of course, in addition. So there's not a high motivation to see everything around it. We've already seen. But the reality is that we understand the importance of changing ourselves in order for the reception of divine truth on the planet to grow. Of course, the same applies to yourselves. The change that you want to occur here in, your, in the USA can only occur when you truly engage this change from a soul-based perspective in sincerity and purity. That's when it will change. That's when more and more people will be interested. And eventually there will be so many people interested that, that, that people will start wondering whether it's a new religion. And it's not a new religion. It's the way to God. It's not a new religion, it's just the way. It's the way God created it to be. And, after, and all of the people who understand the way will eventually understand that too. And then everybody who connects with them will understand, hey, this is not a way to practice a religious faith. It's the way to live the rest of your life. That's how they'll understand it. But we are aware that without our change, 
many of these things cannot occur. So we are not surprised when there is no change over a period of time. Because when we look at our own lives and we say, ah, we haven't changed much over the last two months, of course there can be no change externally if there was no change within myself and Mary over that period of time. Does that make sense? And the same applies to your life. Unless there is some change internally, there will be no change externally associated with your life. And perhaps that's something to contemplate overnight. 